radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. Good evening. How you doing? Here we go. Fade to Black. Today is Monday, April 8th. Happy Totality Day, everybody. April 8th, 2024. I am your host, Jimmy Church, and we are kicking off a brand new week here on Fade to Black. And, excuse me, you can help support the show. You know what to do. Get yourself some Fade to Black t-shirts. Did all kinds of uh, shipping this weekend. And when you get your shirts, right, take a picture, send it to us. We'll add it to the Fade or Not Gallery. All right, everything's autographed. Everything includes shipping. And there's two shirts, and there's two ways to get them. The links are below. I want to let everybody know they got a game changer. Um, uh, New River Moon Coffee is on its way here. So uh, a few game changers uh, are are waiting for coffee. All all the t-shirts have been shipped, but uh, so I've got some some that are waiting for coffee, and we have sent out the shirts on some of those. And uh, and it's so tough to uh, to, get, to track everything, and uh, are going to send the coffee separately. And then I thought, man, this is getting too complicated. Let's just hold off, and the coffee will be here shortly, and then we will send everything out together. So if you received your Game Changer t-shirt, cool, coffee will be following. Um, all right? All right. So the links for everything are below. Kicking off the week tonight. Constance Victoria Briggs is with us tonight, and we are going to be talking about the moon tonight. Yeah, that's right. All of it. That is tonight. Tomorrow night, John Kachuba is with us. We're going to talk about shapeshifters. It's going to be a great show. Wednesday night, Dr. Simeon Hines back with us. Going to talk science, the multiverse, and physics, and 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 all kinds of sciencey type stuff, my favorite thing. And then Thursday night, John Greenwald is here from the Black Vault. And whenever John is on the show, I just call call the show the Black Vault. <laughs> That's it. it you just the the show can go anywhere. He is so involved in the community and and what is going on and Freedom of Information Act and. And so busy over there on the website. And I, I just cannot wait for another amazing conversation with John Greenwald. And that is going down Thursday. So great week coming up tonight, though it is Constance. And we're going to be talking about her encyclopedia series covering the mystical moon. And now here's the thing. What we're going to be doing tonight, every angle, every aspect, every, or nearly every theory behind the moon, we're going to jump into all of that. She's an author. She's a researcher. Uh, she's a public speaker. And she discusses uh, and researches all of those galactic mysteries uh, with us in the unseen world. And she is on all kinds of shows all around the world. She is on various platforms, including radio shows, a podcast, and YouTube channels. And she is talking about all of the mysteries of the universe for us. She is part of our community. And I would like to welcome for the first time to Fade to Black. There she is. Constance Victoria Briggs. Hey, Constance, you got to have the Victoria in there because uh, there's so many other Constance Briggs out yeah. there, you know, imitating and, and stuff. So welcome to yeah. the show. It's uh, great you. to finally have you here. Been a big fan for a long time. Thank and you. now you get the first time guest disclaimer. 
Okay. okay. The, the next right. time you're on the show, you don't get it, but you, you get it tonight, which is this, Constance. It's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends, and where the conversation starts, it starts, where it ends, it ends, but we're going to end as friends. So okay. you have to you have to accept. accept. All right, accept. I accept. <laughs> you know, uh, what, a, what a great day to have you on the show, right? Yeah. The day yeah. totality and the eclipse. And I know you're out here on the West Coast with me, and we, you know, we just got a little nick, you know, we right. got like 50%. But uh, the country, I saw the last eclipse in 2017. It was pretty cool, okay? I was in totality, and it was pretty amazing. But the the country wasn't into it like they were this time around. Man, it was like everybody was was on board. Is that is that pretty cool to have, uh, I mean, for you, to, you know, just to have the nation look, uh, you know, to the skies and, and question what is going on in our own universe and our, in our star system? Yeah, I, 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 first of all, I didn't know people weren't into it. I, every, all the information I got is that people were all over it. I mean, they were down here, you know, going to the beach, going to Torrey Pines Beach and hanging uh -huh. out and, you know, sitting on hilltops and, you know, with their uh, beach chairs and all this stuff. So that was news to me, Jimmy, that they weren't interested. No, you know, no I'm saying, I'm saying last time in 2007. Oh, in uh, in 2017, to me, there wasn't as much hoopla oh, as there okay. was this time yeah, around. No, they were so, yeah, so this time around, they were so on it. But yeah, I like that they had to take a minute and think about the moon and also the sun because there are, I haven't written a book on it, but there are some strange things going on with the sun too that are unexpected. Um, but yeah, they have to stop. They need to, they have to think about it. They, you know, look at the moon and they contemplate and, you know, if, if they've uh, heard any of the anomalous information, maybe they're thinking, you know, who's up there? What's up there? You know, I, I, one thing I talk about uh, a lot uh, on the show is the moon mm -hmm. and okay. I cannot help. I mean, it's gotten to the point now where I appreciate it so much more than when I was a kid. When I was a kid, it's the moon. It's whatever. I look at it now, and I think that is just unbelievable that that is there. Because, it, it, you know, I will stop and take a moment and just look at it and, and you know, take it all in. Because whenever you see a, a science fiction movie, mm -hmm. They're on another planet, you know, and in the background will be another planet or another moon in the background. And you always notice that and you go, oh, cool, science fiction. We've got our own, got our own science moon. fiction right. right here. Yeah. Right, right. People don't appreciate what they have in their own backyard. And, you know, for the most part, I mean, you and I have our, our hands in this information. We have our hands in the research. We're hearing stuff all the time. But, you know, if I go next door and knock on either side of me of my neighbors and I tell them, hey, you know what? The moon may not be real. Hey, there may be people on the moon. They'll say, what are you talking about? What, what, what? Nobody. There's plenty of people out there who don't know. So we have the fascination. When I look at the moon, I wonder, hmm, I wonder what they're doing today <laughs> up there. <laughs> uh, what was the movie Roland Emmerich uh, came out with a few years ago uh, about going to the moon and it was hollow? Oh, I don't, I don't. I, don't uh, oh, I, I watched it so many times. I don't want to take the time to Google it. Uh, okay. Somebody right. uh, pop it up in Twitter. What was the name or Twitter uh, in the chat? What was Roland Emmerich's movie about going to the moon? Hollow moon? Uh, moon uh, Is that the one with Holly Berry you're talking about? Was Holly Berry in it? Oh, was, and I can't was, remember was the name of that one either. Moonfall. Moonfall. Yeah, that was Holly Berry. Yeah. Holly Berry. Yeah. Oh my Moon God! Fall. It wasn't. So, I hate to say it. You know, I just I think she's the greatest actress ever. I'm watching a, a series with her on it. You know, as you know tonight, but that that wasn't very good. Really? I no, I didn't think it was so good. <laughs> okay. Well, that's why God invented vanilla and chocolate ice cream. Right? To give us choices. I was right like, oh there. my God, I could have written that better. But, but Jimmy, I appreciate it that they did it. And I appreciate it that they were trying to share some of the concepts, you know, that we talk about with, with it. But I'm not sure people got it. Well, okay. What? How? How? 
I kind of know where I got my ideas for this stuff. It was, you know, my my mom uh, had a big part in that. And and it was also the time. How did you uh, get your interest in not only the moon, but all things galactic? Right. So, you know, I have to say there was something always in me that attracted me to to the cosmos. And I always believed that we weren't alone in the universe. Even when I was going through my phase of Bible studies and they were like, yeah, you know, we're not the, we're, we are the only ones, you know, if anybody thinks otherwise is crazy. Not to say that all uh, religions think that way, but this particular group did. And I was like, mm, that's just not, you know, jiving with me. So, Anyway, I always had the connection. I was a, a big Star Trek fan. And, you know, I wanted answers. I wanted answers if we were alone. You know, what are we doing here? Why are we here? I was asking that when I was a kid. So um, I started my galactic research and studies about 30, 35 years ago. And I was collecting information and stories and intel, as I call it then, um, but I started with my writing. I started writing about uh, metaphysics and spirituality because I was having um, paranormal experiences. Um, so my first three books dealt with those topics. But you know what? When you're a researcher and writer, you get all kinds of stories coming across your desk. All right. So I was very well familiar with some of the ET groups out there and what we are now referring to as the Galactic Federation. I heard about way back then, but I did not know that the moon had so much going on with it until a little book came across my my desk and it was. Um, uh, <laughs> with, uh, sorry, I'm going to have a brain freeze here for a second. It was our mysterious spaceship moon. I should know that right off the top of my, mm. my, uh, my tongue. Sorry. But it was written by a ufologist by the name of Don Wilson. And I have looked for this person. I can't find him. My uh, Encyclopedia of Moon Mysteries, I, 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 you know, put him in the dedication because I was so impressed by his little book. And he wrote another one called Secrets of Our Mysterious Spaceship Moon. He really turned me on to the idea that there may be something going on up there that none of us had ever thought about. When, when those rumors started, um, and I don't want to get ahead of our skis because we're going to be talking about this a lot, mm -hmm. but when those rumors started, and it, it, this isn't a new thing, this these rumors started in in uh with with apollo and the astronauts and what 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 they saw and what was going on uh in the 70s and and in the 80s and when these rumors started to surface you know the moon rang like a bell right and that uh, they were followed to the moon there were things that that it, it, they were waiting for us <laughs> right to arrive on the moon and these these stories uh were never really um, uh, d denied, you know, it was kind of weird. You would have, have expected, um, somebody to come forward, uh, from NASA or, or the government. No, it didn't. It's made of cheese, but it didn't ring like a bell. You know, they could have said something like that, but they didn't. And why do you think these, these stories started to, you know, that it's artificial and it was towed here, Mm -hmm. um, these these theories uh, started to bubble to the surface. Is it because NASA never really said anything about it, or the astronauts? No, I, I, I contrary, I contrary to what you're saying, they did say things. They weren't supposed to say things. Now, some of them skirted around what, the topic a little bit, and they, you know, weren't always clear. But there's a lot of information. You know, I've got quotes in my books from astronauts and 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 NASA people. You know, and of course, there's always the whist whistleblowers too. But I think that it bubbled to the surface because um, the story started um, circulating, and people could see, for example. Uh, the moon rang like a bell. Well, of course, it didn't really ring. It reverberated. However, it wasn't a rumor. It was something that happened, started with a news conference. So when they first sent that ascent stage crashing into the, into the moon, 
and it reverberated. They, you know, they said, NASA said, you know, oh, you know, it, it reverberated. It was kind of like, you know, it rang like a bell. Well, we really don't know why it did that. It shouldn't be doing that. And I have that quote. One of their scientists said, uh, you shouldn't be doing that. But they didn't elaborate. But they couldn't deny it once they had their own people who, you know, at that press conference said it, they couldn't reel that back in, could they? So they just never touched it again. But it was already out there. And not only did this happen uh, once, it happened on two different missions that the moon uh, reverberated. All right. So what happened with that is, and also, um, there were two scientists that came forward in the 70s that were Russian, that were, worked for the Russian government. And they said, this really, you know, helped take this off. Uh, they said that they thought that the moon uh, wasn't a real, uh, was not an, they thought the moon was an artificial satellite because of some of the material that they studied from the Apollo astronauts, all the information that the Apollo astronauts brought back from the moon by way of, uh, you know, tape, scooping up the, the, the dirt and the sand and all of this stuff. They said, and looking at the size of craters, you know, all of the craters are two and a half, most of the craters are two and a half miles uh, deep where they shouldn't be the same throughout the, you know, throughout the, the, the moon. Um, it, so that showed them that it had a solid hull that was hard to penetrate. Um, they looked at all of these things and they wrote a paper on it. And that I think helped spark some interest. But even before the Apollo missions, the lunar orbiters went up. And they came back with pictures, of course, you know, these are old stories, but it's, I'd like to say, Jimmy, it's, it's new to a lot of people. All right. And so the lunar orbiters brought back pictures of what looked like structures on the moon. And those were not all covered up. Some of them were covered up, but some of them made it into the public domain. And you can Google some of those today. So it's kind of hard to hide everything. All right. They hit a lot. All right. But they, they didn't get it all. Yeah. And NASA, NASA, they should have, well, I guess they couldn't, but they shouldn't have been caught retouching photos because once you retouch one, then they're all right. <laughs> you can't. They were, they, they were busted. And I tell you what, there's this one, one story, uh, true story. And you can Google this. Give your, give your audience some homework. Uh, if you go on and go on Google, and I, I believe it was Apollo 8, um, that, uh, first, you know, went up. They didn't make it all the way to the moon. Uh, but they, they went up. They were doing these tests before we placed men on the moon. We had to take, le go different levels, different steps. So it was Apollo 8. Anyway, they go up there. The first thing that they're seeing up there is this strange, uh, you know, just right above Earth and um, Earth's area vicinity, this strange looking UFO. When I say strange looking, I mean, it wasn't your typical disc. It wasn't a cigar shaped. It was, it looked like in the photo, it looked like white. It was brilliant white, but it could have been silver, I guess. And they got a picture of that and someone tried to cover it up because, you know, they didn't have the technology that we have today. So way back then they started with duct tape and I call it, <laughs> I call it tape gate because there are literally pictures of where they tried to cover up the UFO. They were taking pictures out there in space, but there that thing was. But one of the pictures slipped through. So there are like two pictures where you see where they put tape on this photo, but somebody slipped the third one through and you can see that thing. All right. So they didn't get everything covered up. And even when they tried to, people like Ken Johnston, for example, you know, yep. uh, reported it. And uh, there was one, I don't remember if this was Ken or not, but there was one person who was uh, working in one office and he was sent to, I don't know, retrieve something from an office. And he walked in and somebody was, you know, marking out things in the photo. And he, 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 he was, uh, immediately alarmed because he's, he thought, oh my goodness, I just saw something I don't think I was supposed to. But he said, uh, the guy turned to him and he said, well, you know, we, we found cities on the moon. You know, we're not supposed to talk about it. So yeah, he, there have been people who have seen it. There are stories um, in my moon mystery books where there's one st story where someone was told to throw out pictures 
that had, you know, strange objects, anomalous objects in them. And the guy didn't throw them out. He kept them. And then years later, he talked about them. Yeah, I had, uh, I, for, uh, I forget her name, but she was a photo analyst uh, for NASA. And Donna worked. Hare? Donna What's Hare? That? With a Donna uh, Hare? Uh, Donna could, Hare. Yeah, yeah. It may, maybe. She was a guest on the show. Okay. Um, and she told me uh, uh, something very similar. She mm-hmm. walked in and they had a giant print in front of her, and, and they were retouching it. Because I'm just looking right at it, man. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Uh, I'm painting, you know. But uh, yeah, I think they went a little retouch happy. Well, yeah. then, and then we, um, if either retouch everything, or, or leave everything alone. But if you leave everything alone, then you really can't release those photographs. And so I, I, I get the predicament that they found themselves in, um, but it seems like there is something there. We haven't been back. We're going back in 2026, allegedly. <laughs> yeah. um, we we haven't been back. I, I hope that we do go back. And, and I like the crew that they've assembled. I, I want that feeling that I had when I was a little kid. It was pretty exciting. Those were exciting times landing on the moon. But um, uh, but 50 years for apparently technical reasons, if you can pull it off in 1969, I, I, I think that we've come a long ways and, and we should have... Uh, uh, yeah, it should have been an easy trip going back. Now, let's examine a few different ideas here, okay? Okay. I like, I like, uh, I like them all. I kind of like the Death Star idea that it was manufactured and then towed here. That's pretty cool. I kind of dig that. Um, what, what, where, let's, let's talk about a few of these ideas and, and and where do you where do you kind of land on this? So in my uh, my galactic history book, I talked about this a, a, a quite a bit. You know, I gave the uh, different theories, scenarios, and ideas of what exactly you know this thing could be. And um, so yeah, I talked about the idea that uh, it was placed here, towed here, or sent here into Earth's vicinity for whatever reason. One of the reasons I gave was that it could have been to help Earth, you know, I call it the Garden of Eden theory, to help Earth to thrive with life. That it what the Earth was, the idea is that the Earth was un, unstable until the moon was brought in and that some intelligent beings with the science and the technology to uh, be able to do such a thing took a look at Earth if they didn't even terraform, if they didn't terraform it, terraform it, but that's my other book. Um, but they looked at Earth and they wanted, and that they wanted to stabilize it. Excuse me, I'm getting nervous. <laughs> they wanted to stabilize it. That was one theory. I call it the Garden of Eden theory because then it would have helped life to thrive. Uh, the other idea is that intelligent beings could have driven this thing in because it is a kind of a station. Uh, in the solar system to watch what's going on with the various planets. You know, Earth isn't the only one that uh, had life. Mars is, is, you know, thought to have had life at one point. Venus had a different atmosphere. And, and the idea is that it was placed there for extraterrestrials to observe these different planets. And, uh, or it may have only been there to observe what is happening on Earth because Earth is a desired world full of resources that extraterrestrials may want to use. The other idea is that it may have been brought here because uh, and driven across the universe. Some say it may have come into uh, come in through uh, at the tail of a comet. Others think that it was driven here by extraterrestrials. Um, but the idea would be to these beings, whoever might be in the moon or using the moon, some of them came and were escaping their world. Maybe they were escaping a dying sun and, and came here. And perhaps even they had to vacate this thing, this, this mega structure or spaceship 
you know, and even, you know, some people have said, you know, maybe the people that came in the moon when it came to earth, are we them is a thought. So where do these ideas come from? Well, there is uh, there is a traditional story out of uh, Africa, South Africa, uh, many years ago that, uh, you know, they said the moon is an egg that was hollowed out. And to interpret that, we would say it was a planetoid that was hollowed out by two, two extraterrestrials that were said to be a reptilian type species. And the story is that they sent this moon, they sent this uh, across the universe and placed it here. Now, what was interesting about that is when I mentioned the uh, Soviet scientist, they have the same idea as this traditional tale. And I just wonder if way back then, you know, we hear about us being visited by star people, you know, thousands and even a million years ago that gave us information. Could someone have, you know, given information to, prim to this primitive group? that this really was a structure that was sent by extraterrestrials and placed here. But what is interesting is that it sounds very much like the Soviet scientist theory, mm -hmm. who, who they said, they called it a generational spaceship, which had engines and supplies and all kinds of things in it to sustain a group of people or beings that came up, that was sent across the universe and placed here. The stories are very similar, and it's very weird to me that they are. But not only that, uh, Jimmy, I'm sure you've heard of the Sun Gate of Bolivia, which mm -hmm. is that I've, been, I, I've been there. Oh my God, I, I wish you could go. Yeah. Those symbols talk about this, all right? They say that the moon was uh, brought in, and when it came in, it caused storms and you know destruction and all of this. How would anyone have known that unless star beings again came in when they visited Earth and gave this information and they wrote it on that uh, megastructure, that stargate? So all of these stories kind of tie in together. And I think that's, that's kind of how the, the ball got rolling in the idea that it was sent across the universe. But, he, but here's a very uh, interesting story and one of my favorite. So when I write my books, I like to use science fiction because people – they relate to it and, you know, they just, they like it. They understand a little bit better. So I found it interesting that Gene Roddenberry, who is uh, the, the creator and producer and writer for the original series and, and the second one, he started Star Trek, I mean, of Star Trek. But he is known to have been sitting in on channeling sessions with a woman by the name of Phyllis Schlimmer, who is channeling extraterrestrials who said in, in, in the 60s, they told her that they were in a huge ship. Uh, they had several ships, actually, but these beings were in a ship that was very close to Earth. They were traveling the galaxy. They had people from different worlds, and they were here on uh, in Earth's vicinity to help. Okay? And they wanted to help us in some way. Now, Gene Roddenberry goes, and he creates Star Trek. And the, uh, the, the story is that he uh, was inspired from those channeling sessions to create the series. Now, where am I going with this? In one of his very first episodes, um, uh, titled, I Have Touched the Sky. I have, uh, yeah, I have, I have touched the sky or something like that. Oh, oh no. The world, the world is hollow and I have touched the sky. And the, uh, the Enterprise crew were assigned to follow an asteroid through a space because it was on a collision course to a Federation planet. And when the crew beamed over there, this what they thought was an asteroid, what was shaped and looked like an asteroid, turned out to be a spaceship. Now, when they beamed over, they landed on this. And they, the first thing they saw was structures. And then when they went inside, they were taken inside by beings inside of this um, asteroid craft. And they found a home. It was of people, and it was a generation ship, a generational ship where beings have been living on it for ages, 
generations had died, come and gone and died, and they were on a course for a planet because they were escaping a sun, a sun that had blown up. All right. Now, this is very, very similar to what we're thinking about and hearing about and talking about when it comes to the moon. And I just wonder if Gene Roddenberry got some inside information because it is thought that not only was the moon sent across space, but it is designed to look like a planetary body so that it wouldn't be detected. And it is made of material that could withstand heat and, 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 and radiation and anything that might damage it. All right, the hull is very strong. The astronauts tried to drill into it. The question is, if it's hollow, why is it made this way? What is it designed to protect, protect or whom? The, the uh, Now there's a couple of, I want to stay where we are right now, but I, I just want to make a comment and then we'll come right back. The, the there's, there's another part to this for me where the odds get too crazy. It's in a perfect position. Its size matches up with its distance to the sun, right? And the way that it, it, it is, that, that it's not by accident, right? And the tidal locking and, and where it is at and the timing of it and, and how it, uh, uh, what's the word? It's the spoon that's stirring the pot of stew, Right. You know what I mean? And that's that's the odds of all of that happening. When you have a lunar eclipse and you see you see the moon line up with the sun and they're the same size. Mm -hmm. It's like, wait, 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 wait. That that didn't happen by a roll of the dice. So you place all of that into, you know, you know what I mean? You put you, you keep stacking up the evidence. Mm -hmm. And it suggests something uh, pretty crazy. And I, I, I think the evidence points in one direction and not another. And going back to your point, uh, the, uh, the collection of materials from the moon, this is what I find strange. We know what is Martian dirt, right? We know what is earth dirt. Well, shouldn't why do we need to what's if the moon cracked off of the earth one of the theories right something impacted the moon uh, you know uh, the earth was cracked and then the moon sat out there and then gravity turned it round over the years um we don't have that missing part of earth anywhere you would think uh number one but number two that would mean that the moon's dirt should be the same as the earth Right, right. Shouldn't they be? Shouldn't they match? Right. That's right. That's right. And it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. No. But there, there's so much to unpack here. You asked me. You talked about two different things, and I'm like, okay. I know. So I, I did. I did four. <laughs> I did four. So okay. All right. Okay. You get. You get to take your pick. But I yeah, mean, I mean, all of this evidence, though, uh, Constance, it, yeah. it's it's not crazy talk. I mean, I think that we need to sit down and analyze each one of these ideas and theories. I am, you know, one to think that we, we really need to be having what we used to call town hall meetings. Well, now we would call them zoom meetings, you know, to go through all of this. I mean, we really should be taking it more seriously than, oh, that's interesting. Oh, okay. And going on about our business because it affects us and we don't know what it will do, to, you know, in the future with us. But I would like to get back to that uh, comment you made about the, uh, the eclipse, the eclipses and how unusual they are. So, you know, the idea is that uh, there are different levels of extraterrestrials out there, right? I um, mean, we are, you know, there, what is that? The, I believe that's called the Kardashev, Kardashev theory. Kardashev scale. Thank you. Kardashev scale. Thank you. So there's different levels on that scale. We're not, we're not, we're just like at the bottom. We're like zero, right? But when you look at the age of humanity, we're very young, but there could be beings out there who are, you know, hundreds 
thousands, millions, and billions of years ahead of us. They've had a long time to perfect their science and technology, and they could have now these beings the ability to create life, to terraform planets, to move worlds. All right. So it is thought by some that the eclipses are from an advanced race of beings that perhaps uh, may have seeded humanity. And that is a sign for us that they were using this as a sign for when we became pre ready, uh, intelli um, intelligent, and uh, mature enough to understand that those signs were not uh, signs of a miracle or God, that it took some sort of science and, 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 and mathematician and, you know, technician to be able to accomplish that, you know, the appearance that those planetary bodies can line up like that and, you know, match, that that took intelligence and that they were hoping that we would look up and be able to tell, hmm, that's just more than a miracle, you know, and that is more than a coincidence that was placed there. And hey, maybe it was placed there for a message to us that we're not alone in the universe, that there are other intelligent beings out there. That's what is thought to have happened with that because it's just too uh, far out. You know, I'm not a scientist. I can't explain it scientifically, but I've researched it enough to know that it is just too far out a thing. That, those, that these planets should line up like that. So that's the idea, that it was given it to us as a message uh, that we're not alone in the universe. And the idea and the hope was for us to move forward in trying to figure it out and trying to and try to reach for the stars, which we are trying to do, by the way. So, and I forget, what was the other thing you said, Jimmy? <laughs> oh, well, uh, yeah, yeah. It, that it, it, it's, it's the, it's an odds thing where it, uh, just like DNA or the creation of, of us or uh, where the odds of things just happening on their own, the numbers are just too big. Yeah. The numbers are too big. And when we flip it around the other way, I mean, the odds of uh, a natural placement of a moon and our moon doing what it does for us, the odds of that, and like I said, the way that it lines up with the sun and the dimension and the distance, and you start doing the math and the calculations on it, these are all miracle numbers, unless it was done on purpose. And that's that's why uh, when we flip this around the other way, when we look at the numbers, you're right. There are so many planets just in our Milky Way. You know, 40, 50, 100 billion Earth-like rocky planets. How much life, just in the Milky Way, and there's, what, 2 trillion Milky Ways out there. That's right. Uh, that's yeah. right. The, the, yeah. the odds of us being alone in the universe are looking pretty slim. <laughs> and you still have people, you know, running around thinking that, that that is a thing. And I think that that, you know, we need to think out of the box out of the box and consider all of these things. Some people say, okay, so these are these stories, some of these stories came from the 60s. I don't care that they came from the 60s. We need to be picking them apart and trying to figure things out. Uh, some people say that, oh, you know, I don't believe we went to uh, to the moon or whatever. Well, I do, so I talk about it, right? Well, I don't believe we went to the moon, so I don't know that anybody's up there. Well, I'm here to tell people that before the 1960s, there was evidence of activity on the moon. Evidence that there is uh, someone on the moon, that uh, they may be the beings who even brought the moon in goes back to the creation of the telescope. Even the, the astronomers of old were seeing lights moving on and across and over the moon, and they saw some lights during eclipses. One of them thought they had seen a kind of um, insect moving across. Yeah, 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 oh yeah. Very yeah, very famous, very famous report because it's no different now, I don't, I assume you have a telescope 
Okay. I'm assuming that you do. I do. Okay. I live out here in the desert. I've got a, a nice telescope sitting right there. And I like jumping onto the net mm-hmm. and looking at uh, everyone's videos of the moon. I haven't seen Constance. I have sat for hours and just watched the edge of the moon, right? Adjusting the telescope as the moon is, you know, the earth is moving, right? Just keeping it there, keep in hope, in hopes of seeing something. Yeah. Because we've all seen those videos, right? Yeah, something cruising, something lifting off, something flying around. That's not what that's not supposed to be there. And that's what the ancients were seeing. And the very first telescopes, they're looking at the moon and they see something buzz across it, or they see a giant shadow cast on the moon, or whatever. They chronicled these and they noted them and wrote them down in their journals. And uh, what's it called? Um, what's NASA's ledger called? Ta-da! <laughs> oh, you have it. I, okay. Uh, okay. Is that Na- I, NASA I, Lunar I, Technical Report? I when somebody gave me a copy of that like 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the one that goes to 1967? Yep. That's it's yep, yep, yep. that's the one that I've got. That's the Isn't one that, that I've amazing? got. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. That is I, I'm telling you right now, audience. Go and it's called the NASA Moon Ledger, I think. What's it called? Well, these days they're calling it the NASA Lunar Technical Report. And I have That's to it. say, it's changed the titles a couple of times. That is yes, true. yes. And yeah, but you, you can find it. You can find it. It's out there and it's a public release. And that is a, you know what? That's a page turner right there. It's amazing. <laughs> and you know what? It, it once was a classified document. Yes, and and I'm hearing that you know NASA's kind of regretting <laughs> releasing that thing, but you know it's out there now. And guys, you can get that on Amazon. So basically, what you have in here are um, astronomers going back to the 1600s and yeah, 400 that, that, years, 400, yeah. 400 years of their spotting stuff and making notes about making the moon. Notes. They would see lights up there in uh, different colors, shapes, sizes, geometric patterns, moving across the moon, sitting near the craters of the moon. They even put down how long they would see it, 15 minutes, two hours, uh, the name of the astronomer. And I tell you, the reason I think that this was made was because NASA was planning to send men to the moon. And uh, they... They knew uh, about all of this stuff, and they sent people up there anyway. Um, but I think they wanted a record of it for themselves, um, and they got a lot of it from the British Astronomical Society, who kept you know these 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 uh, records and uh, the astronomers uh, as we moved forward from you know the 1600s. They were sending that stuff there, but they knew about it because they had this information. This was published before the Apollo astronauts went up. So they yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, on. it was nineteen. They uh, uh, they stopped the chronicle. I, I'm going from my memory, and now I'm, you're mm-hmm. making me want to go and 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 dig it out. Um, but uh, I think they stopped in the mid '60s, uh, right July before 19, July what, 1968. July 1968. It was it was uh, published. That sounds right. Published. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, they they stopped the chronicle in '67, right? So there, that was their notes up until the acquired notes until 1967, and published it in '68. Yeah, yeah, it's really good reading, everybody. I, I, I it's high on my list of uh, of stuff. <laughs> you know, it's but- it's real science fiction. That's the thing. Right. That's that's the real stuff. (laughs) So what I love about it Um, now, uh, before uh, we're going to take our first break in about 15 minutes, Um, if 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 we take some of not all of it, but if we take some of the radio transmissions and some of the communications uh, between NASA, Cape Canaveral, Houston and uh, the astronauts that were on the moon, 
and uh, including uh, we we got to talk about Mercury and Gemini uh, as well as Apollo and Apollo eight, nine, and ten before uh, landing on the moon with Apollo eleven. They all have something anomalous in in these conversations, which seems to me that they were waiting for us and they were watching us land on the moon. Uh, and I'm talking about E.T. Uh, from a distance, but they if, if we made it to the moon, they would certainly be interested in that, right? They were watching us land. Yes. So, you know, that just takes us back to whether or not this, the moon itself is some kind of, you know, structure where beings are in there watching us and monitoring us. And it's been said they're even sending information. You know, there's a theory that they're sending information out to higher beings out there, you know, from the moon. But yeah, if you look at the Gemini and Mercury, Mercury missions, they were already, already encountering strange things. All right. Um, Gordon Cooper talked about seeing a UFO uh, and, it, and it was a green color. And he also, I believe it was Gordon, who heard a strange language coming over the radio. All right. And when he said, when I uh, learned about that, I thought, God, he saw a UFO and then he's saying there's a strange, you know, language. Was there, you know, uh, extraterrestrial in that UFO that was trying to communicate with my first thing, right? But it was, uh, so anyway, it was uh, the Gemini missions, the Mercury missions, they were followed, they saw things out there. And yes, Jimmy, that led, uh, that leads one to think that we have been watched the entire time from beginning the beginning of ancient you know history even all the way up to now they were already familiar with our space travel desires and ambitions and where we were so you know right after those came the apollo missions and every single apollo mission was uh has a story and all of them were followed or saw something strange or strange lights and i can tell you about some of those yeah, let's. Uh, yeah, you, you, you turn off your computer sounds. Um, the uh, if you would please, thank you. Uh, some of the quotes, and not only quotes, but there's some crazy video too as well. The imaging, yes, but there's a couple of Apollo clips where you can clearly see uh, stuff cruising around in in the background. Uh, Oh, oh, I don't oh. know how to do it. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Let's, uh, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Um, uh, I, I can. All right. What you do, you just go into Windows down at the bottom in your search bar, put in uh, sound settings, and then when that pops up, you go to the sound settings tab and then. Yeah, there's a bunch of things there. Go to the bottom and just click turn off computer sounds. All of them. That's what you do. That's what you do. Now, what what about um, some of your favorite All sound uh, device situations are- that went down? Are you there? I hope I did it. I still hear you. Okay. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, 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 yep. Can you hear me? Okay, so I hope yeah. it works, Jimmy. This isn't my first rodeo. I can assure you of that. What about um, uh, the you know Santa Claus as used as a reference to ET um, when they said, "Look, they're up on the ridge and they're yeah. they're looking at us." Uh, d- d- who who was looking at you? Okay. And why would why would you reference Santa Claus? So what have you, uh, those are two of my favorites. So I think yeah. So those are two different stories. One is my favorite Christmas tale uh, because uh, when they use the reference of Santa Claus, this actually happened on Christmas Eve, I believe. And uh, so one of the missions were up there, and something did fly by, and they were like, "Woo." Well, you know, what was that? And uh, then they, you know, told Mission Control, yeah, uh, you know, Santa Claus, it does exist. 
Yeah, there is a Santa Claus. <laughs> and 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 they were saying, you know, okay, yeah, that was a joke and saying that, you know, Santa Claus is out there in space, but that's not true. We we pretty much have figured out that they had a lot of catchphrases, um, you know, to talk to each other in code because they didn't want the uh, people on, you know, watching the uh, the moon landings, et cetera, to know that there was something out there, which I still to this day don't understand. Well, we could get into that why they had to cover that up because it is quite fascinating. And had they been more overt about these things, we wouldn't be in the predicament that we are now with so many things being seen in the sky on a regular basis. You know, UFOs, I, there's so many UFOs video out coming by my desk that I, I don't even watch them anymore. I don't have time. But anyway, the other one was uh, you're talking about was the Apollo 11 mission. All right. That is the most uh, famous account I think people recognize where the Apollo 11 astronauts landed on the moon, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. And um, the story is when they stepped out of the moon, out of the ship onto the moon, they saw spaceships sitting on the edge of the crater that they had landed near that they were going to explore and examine. They were freaked out and they got on a secret uh, cable or a secret line to mission control um, called a medical line. They all had it so that if something went wrong, they could reach them without the audience knowing, well, something went wrong. They're seeing extraterrestrial ships and they're saying, you know, there's these ships there, they're watching us, they're big, and, uh, you know, they're massive, you wouldn't believe it, and they didn't know what to do. So they were scared, they called, and, you know, they carried on their mission. Now, the story is, according to one author who worked for NASA at the time, uh, named, Mar I believe it was Maurice Chatelain, or something like that, he said that the ships left after the uh, astronauts landed, he said that the ships left and it appeared to some that the ships were there to help the uh, astronauts in case they didn't land safely. That's what it appeared like because clearly no one bothered the astronauts. I mean, we've sent 12 people to walk on the moon. No one's ever bothered them. So that's what was that, that thought. But there was um, an investigative reporter Linda Moulton Howe tells a fascinating story. And of course, being Linda, she's the only one who would get this new, this story right. She said that she talked to Neil Armstrong's best friend. And the best friend told her that Neil told him when they were coming down uh, from the command module and they're, they're in the lunar module and they're heading towards uh, the surface that they saw the ships sitting on the crater and that they turned turned so that the audience would not be able to see that on film. I thought that was a very interesting part of the story. But then, you know, Jimmy, when I first heard this story about uh, them seeing the ships and them calling on the secret line, I kind of thought, oh, I don't know if that's real or not. You know, uh, it maybe it's hearsay. But then I learned that a gentleman named Christopher Kraft, who is known as the godfather, uh, not the godfather, the father <laughs> uh, of mission control, uh, and who worked very uh, closely with the Apollo astronauts who created mission control, really, he came forward years and years later and said, yeah, that did happen. So I feel like if you can't believe the uh, creator of mission control, who can you believe? So, yeah, I believe that story is true. They were there when they landed. And they knew they were coming. And every single Apollo ship had an encounter. Do you remember uh, in the beginning of 2001 in Space Odyssey, right, when they've, they've uncovered the monolith on the moon and they're on – their way uh, to have a press con uh, I mean, not a, a, a meeting about this and why this needed to be kept secret. 
And so they have this meeting. Now, and you have to remember, that's 1968. All right? And the way that the cover-up happens there and why it was uh, it had to uh, and why it had to be kept secret, it seems like history is repeating itself. And the the monolith was deliberately buried. So when we get to a certain point in our evolution, where we can make it to the moon and discover this and unbury it, right, and uncover it, then that would show ET where we are in, in, in on the technical scale, right? Well, th- that seems like that's exactly what's going on right now. It's like it's playing out like a science fiction movie, but this time it's for real. That's the that's the crazy part. This is not. This is not anything new. And and one one last, as you address that, and we go into the break, when NASA had their uh, press conference five years ago, and one of the scientists said, you know, famously now, right, or infamously, however you want to look at it, well, you know, we'll, we'll go back to the moon when when we figure out the technical hurdles. Right? We got a problem. We can't make it through the Van Allen belt. I'm like, what? What? I didn't hear that. When- yeah, 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 it was about five years ago. And, and and when and I was all over that statement. So there were others in the community too as well. It's either we did go in 69 or we didn't. Which which and why I thought we didn't go back because of budgets, but now you're saying we didn't go back because of the Van Allen belt and radiation issues. It's it's all very strange to me. Well, you froze there for a moment, Jimmy, so I, I missed a little bit of that. But I hadn't heard about the Van Allen belt. I've heard, and I, I apologize. I just I just don't I don't I didn't know that. What I've heard is that they didn't have the technology to uh, be able to do it again, and people have thought that that was crazy. Uh, But I have to tell you, I don't think that's crazy. And I'm going to tell you why. Because from my research, NASA in the 60s was so disorganized. Do you know that they have buildings of files? This stuff wasn't on the computer like we have. These were all in files. And some of them have been lost, misplaced. Heck, they found a very uh, vital piece of uh, information a few years ago, it was on a mainstream news about, you know, music in space. I don't know if you remember that story, that they heard music in space. It wasn't really really music. The astronauts went for the first time uh, behind uh, to the far side of the moon, and they heard these strange noises over the, um, over the radio. And I, I think that it may have been extraterrestrials trying to reach the astronauts. But anyway, this my point is this stu- this story, this tape was in a, a drawer somewhere for like years in some building that they, they found it. They were terribly disorganized. They lost files. They did accidentally throw out some, some files. And they don't know how to start it again because all the people are gone. You know, so I kind of feel like, yeah, they could be that disorganized back then. I I live in a house where we have a, a radio, you know, for for my front gate to be able to buzz people in and talk to them and all this. It hasn't worked since I moved in. Do you know why? Because they don't know how to create it. The parts are gone. And somebody said, well, Constance, it's just a little radio. They, they, they're, they're, they're NASA. I'm, I, I said, I'm telling you, their stuff was in boxes, papers. They don't know where it is. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was uh, three years ago, four years ago, they found uh, the NASA Apollo tapes yeah. in the basement of a Burger King in 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 Granada Hills. Yeah. Now in Chatsworth, and so it's just like, wait, what? What? And almost never found. They were going to tear the building down. So the crew went in and they found the boxes and they were the the two-inch videotapes. Yeah. What, yeah. What? I mean, you know, all of that's true, but then some of it may be a smoke screen too. They, you know, because they are talking about going back. They keep changing the date. Who knows why, really? But it could be a smoke screen. You know, maybe they uh 
they're just you know trying to put it off or, or get, get get another gentleman's agreement with ET to go back and Airbnb it on the moon. And uh, we'll be right back. Let's take our break right here. Our guest tonight, Constance Victoria Briggs. We are talking about the, well, I was going to say mysterious. Is Is that the right word? Right? The mystique of our moon. We'll be doing all of that when we come back after this short break. Stay with us. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get your alerts and access to over 2,000 videos. Click that subscribe button right now. JimmyChurchRadio.com and get the Fade to Black official podcast. 2,000 episodes, all of them commercial. Month. This is Jimmy Church. Please visit and explore Egypt this October 3rd through the 14th, 2024 with Billy, Elizabeth, myself, and very special guest and the number one podcaster in the world, Sean Kelly. It's simple to do. Just go to ForbiddenKnowledge.com and click on Upcoming Tours or click on the link below. We'll see you there. Watch Into the Vortex on Gaia TV. It's fade to black for the screen. Simple to do. Go to Gaia.com, search Jimmy Church, or click on the link below. Follow Fade to Black on Twitter at J Church Radio. Get all of the show updates every single day. It's it, it's now called X, but who cares? How you doing? Jimmy Church here. Special announcement. Get your Fade to Black t-shirts. That's right. Help support the show. Help support everything that we do over here. We've got two t-shirts. We've got two ways to get them. And right now, if you get a Game Changer membership for a limited time, you will get Fade to Black Blend Coffee with your Game Changer membership. That's right. We have two t-shirts. We have the original, the classic Fade to Black t-shirt. You know you want one. Post a picture. Send it to us. We'll put it in our Fade to Black gallery. And we've got the new official Fade to Black t-shirt drawn by Michael Oming. 
Two t-shirts, two ways to get them. Get yours today. Everything is in stock. Everything gets autographed. Everything includes shipping. And you're going to get a tracking number. And with a Game Changer membership, you get an email to me. You get unlimited commercial-free downloads of the show. Those are uploaded every single night after the show to the website. So don't delay. Get your Fade to Black t-shirt today. Go back, Lee Tappy. Go to jimmychurchradio.com and become a fade or not. Get a membership. That's right. Everything is commercial free. You have access to downloads and you get to call yourself a fade or not. River Moon Coffee, makers of the fade to black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right, welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, our guest, Constance Victoria Briggs. We are talking about uh, the mystique, the mysteries behind our moon. And the moon is up there every single night. I had, uh, I want to talk about structures on the moon. And now, I've, I'm have i going to share this with you. It's, it's, it's quick. I had this thing... Uh, I, I still do it where I, I had this vision. I think, I think it was in a dream, but anyway, I, I caught myself looking up at the moon and it like is e exploding or something impacts it. And, and I always, when I catch myself looking at the moon, is this the moment is this the moment? It's like weird. And this went on for years and years and years. I don't talk about it as much anymore, but uh, I still look up hoping not to see it explode, but to see something crazy going on. Uh, I, I, I would just love for something like that to go down. Um, let's talk about structures on the moon. What, what evidence uh, have you uncovered? Yeah, so uh, there's old evidence and there's new evidence, you know. Um, the story uh, started back in, in the 70s uh, with the Luna Orbiter and some fabulous uh, researchers that located all kinds of structures on the moon and brought it to uh, public uh, attention. Um, at that time, what they found um, and brought to light were pyramids, pyramids, uh, uh, spires, uh, buildings shaped like uh, the Washington Monument, uh, what looked like a, could be a satellite dish, towers that were miles and miles high, uh, areas that looked like they were uh, mining something, you know, construction uh, type, uh, a construction going on like I don't know what they were extracting from from trying to extract from the moon you know the moon is not it's not flat like some people think and smooth it has valleys and mountains and things and they were trying to do it look like ETs were working on something like that um so uh and then there was one um researcher who talked about saying seeing structures that were partial that looked like they had been blown to bits you know, when I when I looked at those kinds of things, I I kind of began to tie that into to Earth a little bit. But before I, I go into that, I, I just wanted to say now uh, astronomers are looking at what appear to be whole buildings, and it looks like there are lights again, again like what the Apollo astronauts saw, lights around craters. And someone even lo likened it to a parking lot. All right. Um, Let's see. 
way back when uh, the the Apollo astronauts said that they thought there were bottomless craters, and then some of them said that they had seen lights emanating from craters. There were also oh domes. The astronauts said they saw lighted domes which, uh, you know, can lead you to believe that there's some sort of energy source coming from, you know, this, you know, inside of the moon. Uh, today, they are seeing what we look like whole buildings that may or may not be abandoned, roads, pipes. Yeah, I've seen the pipes. Yeah, the it's pipes crazy. are crazy. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, an area that looks like a train was going over it. And actually, one of the contactees did talk about being on a train on a moon. That's a very interesting story, but I don't know if that's connected. So we've got two scenarios here. We have we have structures on the one hand that look ancient and like they have been blown to bits, maybe in a war. And then we've got structures that are completely whole. And there is even one astronomer online, he's all, he's always up and he's talking about the moon, and he's filming the moon, and he says, you know, it's looking like a whole city on the surface. And I, in my book, I called it, you know, the moon metropolis, a moon metropolis, it looks like. And if there are, there are things that, you know, it's being hidden from us, but, you know, with all of the technology we have, there are people who are reporting these things. I saw today, even, I just want to say really quick, a video of what looked like a mega structure over the moon. All right. It wasn't CGI. That was interesting. So we're getting all kinds of feedback, but the structures look like, you know, there, there are two things going on. So in our ancient times, we have areas on earth that look like they were bombed uh, with atomic weaponry. And on the moon, we're, they're saying that there are areas that look the same. And, you know, I've, and possibly Mars. So I have raised the question as to whether or not the three of, uh, you know, the three planetary bodies, Mars, Moon, and Earth, were fighting each other? Or were they fighting an unknown foe out there? Because they, all of them have, uh, evidence of an ancient war. So, but when you look at the modern, what might be a modern day metropolis on the moon, you know, that just leads us to the question of who and what is up there. And are they using the inside and the outside of the moon, perhaps just like in that, that Star Trek episode, you know? So yeah, it's something going on. Lights are being seen up there all the time. Ships, there's definitely something going on. Yeah, it, it, the um, uh, the other part of it is if we go back uh, as soon as we started to develop the radio, and I'm talking about Tesla and Marconi, right? There was a big race going on, and this exciting new technology and building antennas and listening and 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 doing all of that. Well, Tesla comes straight out. I mean, this was headlines around the world, you know, signals, you know, from the moon and signals from Mars and extraterrestrial signals. Yeah. Uh, and 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 that, that was the beginning of it because that was the beginning of radio. But th th there seems to be uh, an entire history uh, over the last 50 years, 60 years, 70 years of picking up signals from the moon. Are we picking up ET communication that they are transmitting back to their home worlds? Or do you think that maybe they're trying to communicate with us? You know, there could be a couple of things going on here. And I've often wondered if when you're looking at uh, the moon, you were talking about these signals, could there be more than one group up there? Because it sometimes seemed to me that I've wondered if people are, are there trying to ask for help. I mean, we've not only had the radio signals, but we've had lighted signals where it looked like some sort of similar to Morse code of lights blinking all at one time all over the moon. Was that designed for us to see? And if so, why? Because they clearly have uh, the technology to send the radio signals. So I was wondering if there's, you know, something going on like that. But yeah, I think there may be beings on the moon who are trying to reach us in a variety of ways. Um, and, you know, I talked about the language before. That wasn't the first time they had a, they heard a language. There was another time when the Apollo astronauts were up there that they recorded a language and they brought it back to Earth and they tried to decode it and they couldn't. 
All right. So, I mean, that wasn't something that was covered up. But yes, they are trying to reach us. Somebody up there may be trying to reach us. And as crazy as this sounds, it could be someone that, you know, do doesn't have the ability. I mean, maybe it's not all equal up there. I think that the moon is an inhabited world. It is a country on its own, with its own culture, its own civilization, and it may have its own caste system. You may have beings, because we've seen the, uh, the uh, UFOs leaving the moon. We've seen fleets of ships leaving. Are they coming here? Are they going elsewhere in the solar system? I don't know. But maybe, because clearly they can reach us, they can communicate, but there may be some who are trying to alert us of their presence that don't aren't privy to all, the, all of the technology. I know that's a far-fetched thing, but I try it's to see not, that. It's, uh, <laughs> but, but Constance, it's not. Yeah. And you know why I say it's not? Look what we are doing. Right. At our level of technology, what are we doing? We're looking at Enceladus, right? We're looking at Titan. We're looking at Europa, uh, not only for signs of life, but to go and research and to hopefully land on and check out. That's what we're doing. Why wouldn't E.T. do the very same thing with us? We've got that giant thing hanging out there. It it may be artificial, but no matter what, it's certainly just sitting right on the top of the earth. So why not use that for a takeoff point? Also, um, uh, staying on this, mm -hmm. when, when the question arises, well, you know, E.T. coming all the way across the universe, you know, to come in and flying saucers, you know, it takes long. What if they're just traveling from the moon? What if they're already right? What if they? What if they? They're just literally. They've got a moon base, and 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 the moon is hot, and that's what we're seeing here. That's a that's a that's a day trip. It's right. A day well, trip. that's what I say. I I think that I don't think that the only ones visiting us are from the moon, but I do believe that yes, a lot of the ships we see are from the moon. You know, there has been talk of the moon being a kind of a stopover uh, base for different beings and uh, for, for to do something as simple as refueling or um, having a meeting, you know, who knows? But yeah, I think that they're coming here. I think that it was very interesting that we uh, didn't get very far in our space travel before we bumped into someone out there. I think it's very interesting that uh, each of the Apollo missions were followed and they knew exactly what we were doing because they've been monitoring us, that they knew we were coming. Yeah, I think they're coming from, from the moon, not all of them. Now, when, um, when people talk about uh, things that the extraterrestrials are possibly already doing, I just want to say, as far as the moon being hollow and and, and possibly having uh, people inside. Our scientists at NASA has, have said that when we go to colonize the moon, it would be a good idea to move our base, have our base inside, because we would be protected from the elements. All right? Obviously, you know, someone has beat us to that idea. But I'm just saying that it is something that is not unlike what we have talked about doing ourselves. It's just that other people have already colonized the moon. And who knows, it may be the same with Mars. And I just also want to say that the hollow, yeah, I covered this a little bit, but the hollow earth, uh, the, the hollow moon is a thing. But that may be a thing throughout the solar system, hollow planets. Uh, the earth has some areas, a lot of areas that are hollow. That's another show. Uh, Mars's moons are thought to be hollow. So, and even, you know, there's some talk of the sun. The sun is having some, some quite uh, shocking things with it. And people are wondering if there's more to the sun than we've been told because they're seeing ships flying around it. And they believe that sometimes when there are solar flares, there are doors opening in the sun and ships going in there. So, you know, I just wanted to say that the idea that the moon may be hollow and have beings inside of it is not uh, something that we haven't come up with ourselves. Um, 
Gosh, what was the other thing that you said, Jimmy? <laughs> I can't remember. I'm just so, 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 so into this conversation. I said, I said something. It wasn't that profound. If I, if I didn't, if I don't remember it, uh, the, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. It's so much. Yes, I know. And oh my God, I was going to address it. Uh, you were saying that they were out there. Oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing the same thing. We're out exploring um, all of the other moons. Mm -hmm. And and when we looked uh, at the close-up images of uh, Enceladus, and also with Titan, too, as well, not so much with Europa, but even Pluto, where there seems to be lights on those uh, different cosmic bodies, and you have to ask yourself, what what's the source of those lights? And w when we go and land on Bennu, right? We just retrieved uh, the stuff off of the asteroid Bennu. Pretty incredible feat. Well, why wouldn't ET be doing the exact same things? Exactly. And especially yeah. if they're years, they are years ahead of us. And one thing that I've been you know, I, I have my little Star Trek references again, you know, that show that's on called Strange New Worlds. I've been telling people, you know, perhaps Earth is a strange new world. This is a strange new world. We think we're the only ones out here and we have the highest technology or, or others do. I don't think so. But obviously, there are beings that could be out there that are exploring the universe, that are traveling to planets, that are trying to learn about new life and new worlds, and we are one of the worlds that are being explored. Now, with um, the control that NASA had uh, with Apollo, now we're, we're getting ready to do Artemis, but the other part uh, with uh, Artemis and uh, that is different than Apollo is we've got private companies doing all the heavy work, right? And and so what? It's one thing to control the information like NASA did before, but now we've got uh, a, a moon internet, two of them, right? Already set up. We just set up the lunar time clock. Did you did you hear about that last week? NASA no. now has lunar time. Yeah, it's called LTC. Okay. So th there's now a lunar time zone. Oh, by the way, no daylight savings time on the moon. They they, they made a point uh, to make sure that we understood there'd be no daylight savings time on the moon. But the um, uh, th to have private companies going to the moon where we've got live streaming now, we've got 4K, we've got the internet, we've got all of this going on. Will it be more difficult uh, to keep things under wraps uh, if if we have private companies and private astronauts uh, going to the moon? I think that is already difficult, but yes, it will be more difficult. First of all, there are not so many people who are keen on keeping this kind of thing a secret. They don't seem to care anymore. Especially, I don't think Elon Musk is gonna <laughs> gonna care. <laughs> um, but no, I, I think it would be harder to uh, to keep things under wraps. And I think that we are going through a period in time where we are supposed to know this information that is slowly going out. That the resistance that we have from some people to uh, get it out in the open, I think this is just all part of growing pains that probably any world goes through when they're first seeking out first contact, um, and in our case, first contact and disclosure. I think these are growing pains, fighting, you know, people to, you know, come forward. But eventually, it's all going to be out there. It's going to be very hard to cover it up. Heck, it's hard to cover it up now, all right? We're talking about them doing, you know, their, the organizations doing their thing out there, but look at all of the information coming about, uh, coming out about UFOs all of the uh, pictures, people talking about extraterrestrial contacts, and I'm not talking alien abductions. I've uh, researched a lot of people who have talked to and been approached by extraterrestrials and say that they've gone on their, even flying on their ships. And some of these are very prominent people. I'm going to write a book on it. Okay. So yeah, they're going to have a harder time keeping it under wraps and eventually it's all going to explode. And we're going to know the truth about everything. Can we handle it, though? 
We can handle it. And I'll tell you why. Because we are being prepared and have been uh, on this um, this course of knowledge, I don't know, since the 40s. I think they've, they've uh, extraterrestrials are involved in educating us that uh, to the idea that we're not alone in the universe and that we eventually, if we behave, will become a part of a galactic community. They're waiting on that. We're a, we're a new species. We're still young. They're waiting for us to mature. We're still going through, you know, fighting wars, and we're still kind of primitive in our behavior. But they have been educating us in one of the ways. It's my understanding that they're using, you know, science fiction and social media. Um, I've heard that there are, are ET scientists here working with our scientists. You know, that's things that kind of seep out, you know, and into the news, um, uh, people talking and whistleblowers, uh, and that they have um, extraterrestrials, even maybe they're from the moon, but live, living here among us, you know, working on Earth. People who have said that they've, you know, with nothing to lose and, and, and didn't gain any mo money, just saying, you know, I saw this person and he looked very strange. He was not human. And you know, we're hearing those things all the time. So yeah, I think that eventually we're going to be facing our contact that we've all been looking for. And are we ready? I think we're ready. I just posted an article today uh, where a congressman had approached, I forget the, the gentleman's name that led the hearings uh, on, on the Hill. The, the, and he said, uh, no, you need to stop pushing for disclosure. There's going to be riots. You know, people are going to be rioting. People aren't going to be rioting. People are open now to the idea that extraterrestrials are out there. They've been watching Star Trek. They've been watching Star Wars and people are excited. And also, as far as religion goes, you know, there are, there are groups that say, you know, the religious people can't handle it. Well, I have had religious people ask me, you know, what do I, what do I think of this? And can I explain this to them in terms of God? I haven't seen anyone freaking out. I've seen people who are seeking knowledge and a lot of them are kind of falling away because they're not getting more intelligent answers than we're alone in the universe. That's no longer flying with a lot of religious people. So no, no I, it's not. They've been listening to voices from heaven for a long time. <laughs> so so I think that I think that they're they're ready for that. I I, I went to Hollywood uh, on a Saturday night driving down Sunset Boulevard. And you know what the billboards were all the way down Sunset? No, three, right. three, three body problem oh. on, on Netflix. And, and that just goes to show you Netflix. The biggest thing out of Hollywood, you know, this year is a TV series about contact mm -hmm. and about a, a signal. Now the, this TV series is not, like Strange New Worlds, which I love, by the way. I love all Star Trek. But it's very technical, and it's very deep, and it is uh, time-consuming for the brain to absorb. But it's the number one show. And it's that it's it's number one because the this isn't our community that's making the show number one. It's the world making right. the show number one. You know what I mean? And that's where we're at. I think, yeah, I think we're expecting it. We're cool with it. And if we can watch a technical, tech, heavy, heavy technical uh, TV series like Three Body Problem, I think that's uh, that's where we're going. Yes. Have you I, seen it? Have I haven't. It? I haven't. You know, I just heard about it in the last few weeks, and I've been incredibly busy. I haven't been able to turn it on. But I, I plan to watch it probably this summer. I'll be able to uh, relax and uh, turn that on. I wanted to say that along those lines of, of what people are thinking, um, when we're looking at the, our state of the world, I think people are also interested in how we can better it. And a number of people have said that if we come in contact with ETs, it would be great because they have higher technology and maybe they can help us. Maybe they can give us some sort of technology to save the planet. 
I don't know, but I've heard people saying it. So they do, there are people that have that hope, which is interesting. And I say in my book, my Earth's Galactic History book, you know, we we have, we can either look toward uh, a better future, a, a more uh, promising future, a, a space-faring future like Star Trek, or we can have an apocalyptic world. It is hoped that if we make contact that they will help us to get this place into shape and we'll have that nice space faring future. But so people are concerned about that. So, yeah, I think that, I think that we're ready. The it's not, you know what? Let's flip this around. Okay. It's not whether ET gives us technology. That's not what would be most important. In fact, it, it wouldn't even matter. We wouldn't understand anything that they gave us anyway. But that's not what's most important. What's most important is the question is answered. And now we have a reason to be earthlings instead of divided. Yep. That's, that's what's most important. Just get, get it out in the open. We're not alone. We're not alone. And, and, and then we can stop the divide. On this planet, we, we can become earthlings and consider ourselves whole and have a future to look forward to and, and making friends with our space brothers and sisters. It's not the technology, right? It's not curing cancer or, or cleaning the world's oceans or whatever it is that you expect E.T. to give us or, or space-time travel. No, that's, we don't need any of that. What we need is to get our house in order. And that's what that knowledge would do for us. It would change the way we look at ourselves. There is, um, I agree. And there is a gentleman that has been around for ages, uh, not age, <laughs> he's not that old, but he's been around for a long time talking about uh, uh, making contact with the Andromedans. He is an Andromeda uh, Andromedan representative. His name is Alex Collier. Yeah, I know and Alex. He said something really interesting, and it just sticks with me. He said that the Andromedans told him that uh, mankind uh, needs to grow up, that we need to do away, of course, with our weapons, and that if we don't grow up, they're basically going to have to, you know, step in and step up contact earlier than, uh, you know, we're supposed to have it in order to prevent us from killing life, you know, all the life here and destroying the, the planet. And that if we don't grow up, then there might be some consequence. What does that mean? You know, so it really makes you think that uh, there are, you know, just not just extraterrestrials from the moon watching us. There are others in the galaxy that are watching Earth, and they would like to help us, you know, to uh, further ourselves. They would love that, and they're waiting. They're waiting until we grow up, so that they can introduce us themselves on a mass level and not instead of just individuals. But you know, you know, what's going to happen if we don't? Because they are worried that our behavior here affects the rest of the galaxy. So, no, for sure, for sure. Continue, continue. No, that was it. That was the good Well, hit. see, here, no matter what, no matter what, the facts are simple. Our sun will eventually get unstable. And when it does, Earth is really going to be a bad place to hang out. Okay? Yeah. It's going to be a real bad place. Yeah. So... We don't have a choice. We have to leave this planet. Those generational ships, those colony ships that you were talking about earlier, we've got to build those. And when we do and we fill them up and we blow this popsicle stand in search of something else out there, we need to understand the universe, who is out there, and we need to be on the same page with them. We can't venture out into a war zone because we we were being humans the whole time. Right? We can't we can't have we can't have that. We we need to make friends with everything because eventually 
we're going to be heading out into their neighborhood. True. True. And it, but I have to say, it doesn't look like, uh, from what you, you know, you've heard this from our, the meetings that have happened with certain extraterrestrial groups with governments. Some of those didn't go very well. Did you hear that? They didn't no, go I very have well. Heard, I have they heard tried, that. They tried to make agreements with some of uh, the uh, leaders of Earth in uh, exchange for technology. If we would uh, give up our weapons, they would give us some technology. And at that time, this was many years ago, It, would, it the, the, the story is that they said, you know, no, every nation needs its weapons and, you know, blah, blah, blah. It didn't there, go well. But I think no, we've grown. I think we've grown. There is uh, a really good movie, um, independent film. It's called The Eleventh Green. Mm-hmm. And if you if you get a chance, watch it. Uh, I've talked about it many times uh, before, and it's about that. Mm-hmm. It's about Eisenhower and the agreement. Uh, and the treaties reached with the extraterrestrials. The reason why it's called the 11th green is because it takes place in Palm Springs on the 11th green of a golf course. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there's a, yeah, 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 yeah. It's an amazing movie. It's, uh, oh. uh, it's, it, it goes much deeper than that, but that's the premise of of the movie is Eisenhower and his agreements. And I don't question, um, I used to th- consider that stuff just like science fiction and, and things. Um, but Edwards Air Force Base, which is up the street from me here, it's literally up the street. Mm-hmm. I go over there almost every day. Um, Eisenhower went to Palm Springs and on the books, he had to go visit a dentist and, you know, he had a toothache or whatever, and he disappears. The story is he went out here. It was then called Moroc Field. Um, okay. Came out here. ETs came down. The stories about uh, the video, uh, the things that have been seen in uh, and around Moroc and Edwards Air Force Base, this goes back for decades and continues. I still see, I see strange stuff out there all the time. So I don't put that out of uh, too far out there. I, th- I think that, yeah, there is a very, very real possibility that this stuff occurred and it happened right down the street from my house. It's right. Crazy. Right. Yeah. No, I believe it, it, it occurred too, but it just shows you where we are, you know, in a collective state of mind, you know, that at that time we weren't, we weren't ready, but I think we've grown today. And I think if they came back and tried to make an agreement I think they might get a different result. I think people are are are, are fearful. I, well, I guess it depends on the leader, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's true. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I don't know if we're smart enough to understand. Do you remember? You know, whatever it is, the technology that I mean, what would they? What would they give us that that we don't already have? Well, we need cure for cancer. Well, That's science, uh, I know. Yeah, uh, no, we, yeah, I, no, I'm with you. I'm with you there. We, we'd like to colonize the moon and Mars pretty quickly. You know, our planet yeah. may be dying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, or do they it, have the ability to terraform another another world? Oh, they certainly do. Well, then, you know, maybe we would need that. And by the yeah. way, that is another another idea that NASA has talked about terraforming world so that's not just science fiction that's something our own scientists are talking about hey i think and i covered this in my my last book i think the earth was terraformed somebody knows how to do it that would could be something they could share with us because we might need to vacate this planet pretty quickly yeah 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 And, and, and i i just referred to the sun okay what if you know, some kind of asteroid or some kind of cosmic event is is going to happen. And we've got a couple of years to prepare, right? As as 
we're seeing something approach and 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 we have to overcome that. Are we ready for that right now? Are we ready? I don't no. I don't know if we are. No, we're not ready. We're not no, ready. We're not ready. We're not if, ready. If some uh if some extraterrestrial group wanted to come and take over Earth, we're not ready. What would we do? We don't have that technology for either of those scenarios. But I do tell you what I think we have. That I think that there are galactic hierarchies out there that are protecting younger worlds that don't have that kind of self-defense capabilities, all right? I, I've heard of asteroids being pushed away from Earth. I've heard of missiles being disarmed on Earth. I've heard of extraterrestrials coming down in, in ships and interfering in wars. There's just some of it. So I think we do, people don't like it when I say this always, but I do think that there is someone out there looking out for us and are offering protection. I, I even think we might have sentries that are, are stationed at certain points. Or we would have been done for by now. Earth is full of resources. All right? Um, we have seen some problems with uh, cattle mutilations and alien abductions. Um that according to what I my research, they they've been resolved. I mean, one one of ufologists said the other day, no, 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 abductions are still taking place. And but I I haven't heard of any lately, and I've heard that they ended. We had that problem. It, I believe it was resolved. And uh, so I, 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 I I was abducted about six months ago. Oh, <laughs> you see Constance's face. What? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, I think that they're happening, yeah. but yeah. they they're not happening the same way uh, all the time. In in other words, we're being visited by so many different types of of cultures and species yeah. Yeah. that you're not seeing a repetitive type of abduction um, but if you look at Pascagoula or Betty and Barney Hill or Travis Walton you know the th three of the biggest cases out there all completely different all completely True. different experiences those were three different those weren't the same aliens no. so three different uh, situations and with uh, with my experience, mine was I don't know if I was teleported or or how it happened. I was with Billy Carson, and uh, I found out all of this through regression. Okay. And I was on the I was on the ship Constance for about five seconds. That was it. That was it. And I was there. I I looked around the room, and then I was back on Earth. That was it. It was it was like the, a weird. Why I did can, you were abducted? I uh, I've had I was, experience, but I don't think I was abducted. Yeah, I don't see. See, I think I was shown mm -hmm. something. That's different, um, right? But some people may confuse that, like my experience, as being abducted. Mm -hmm. That's all that I'm saying. And and so it's it's a different type of 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 abduction experience today where before we didn't understand what was going on so you would assume that it was something physical. Sometimes it is physical, for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So my experience, you know, I talked to Billy about it. Mm -hmm. I said, "Billy, man, was I acting strange?" Did you notice that I was gone? <laughs> or did I disappear? <laughs> right. And he said, no, man, you didn't disappear. You were there uh, the whole time. So um, I, I don't know. But, I, but what I saw, yeah, that, that was real. That was well, real. That was real. It was crazy. You know, Jimmy, you can leave the body astrally. You know, and and be somewhere else, and people are looking at you, and you, you you know they think you're sitting or you think you're sleeping. And there are um, there are beings that have the technology to be able to, uh, you know, extract that part of themselves and uh, perhaps someone else and take them for a benevolent reason, not necessarily you know a, a bad reason, but maybe to show you something or maybe to help you. In some ways, my bit, my understanding. But yeah, there are there are extraterrestrials who have on worlds that know 
that they are able to leave their body and travel. Whereas for us in our world, this is still, you know, something that people are working on believing. The well, whole- see, that's, the, that's the difference, though. That I love that, Constance. That's the difference. Right there, you hit the nail on the head. Our technology deals with atoms, physical things. Everything is physical, 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 things you can touch. That's that's our level. That's where we are at. Yeah. ET's technology is interdimensional. It's it's of the non-physical. It's consciousness. It's entanglement. It's the ability to do all of these things that, for us, we're still, what? Uh, we got rocket ships. Rocket ships. <laughs> Fire. Yeah. It's our technology. Our technology literally is a big lighter. Yeah. That's as, but that's as far as we've gone. Right, the, the, you would take the technical leap, the next stage, when we're dealing with extra dimensions and parallel worlds and and the multiverse and and wormholes and and time travel and and consciousness. That's that's the next step, and we're we're down here. No, we're still we're still we're still living in trees. We're still in the trees, yeah. Well, again, that takes us back to whether or not extraterrestrials would want to share technology to help us advance. Now, the research that I did on extraterrestrials, no matter where they are, I don't know, maybe some of these guys are on the moon, but, um, you know, in in my, my last book, I named groups of extraterrestrials that in their worlds, mostly they're advanced and most of them are at peace. All right. Those are things that they can teach us. Those are things that they can they can give us and help us to grow. It's my understanding that they want us to move into the galactic community. That was always their goal for us. The cedars of of us want that. So yeah, they could get in here and 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 teach us a thing or two. Um, I had an experience uh, recently where I I have. Uh, I, I have out of body experiences where I wake up and I'm conscious that I'm elsewhere. And I woke up and there were these three beings there. And uh, I tell you, I have a lot, I have a huge library. And I've been through all of my extraterrestrial books trying to find a picture of them and I can't. And it, you know, I'm just, they were very, they were three female beings. They were humanoid. I couldn't have told the difference except for their eyes. Their eyes were just, uh, so um, large and greenish black, and I even I can't even describe them. But uh, clearly, they were trying to help me. Something had happened to me. Something happened. I was in the astral, and I can still see them. Look, one of them looking down so closely at me, and I can't find them. Maybe I've revisited them because sometimes when we uh, leave astrally, we don't remember. Sometimes we can, but they were clearly trying to help. So whoever they were, they have the ability to see problems in us and help. All right. So that's technology or science that they, you know, could help humankind with. It's just my thought. Well, that's where that's that's where the uh, the acceptance of of it all needs to get crossed. Where we need to get out of the physical side. You know, cell phones are great technology, you know, and you and I doing what we're doing right now, that's pretty amazing. But it's still just material, right? It's not, it's not advanced. Uh, we're looking at our advancement in technology with physical stuff with atoms and particles and molecules and 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 building faster better smaller things that's uh, no the next step and that's where you're exactly right so we need to be able to accept 
something that far out from E.T., where E.T. goes, well, you know, ah, ah, physics and math, okay, yeah, 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 we did that, but that was a long time ago, <laughs> right? Right. We're, 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 no, no, man, it's all about, <laughs> it's all about dimensions, man. <laughs> you know, they're just going to be, and we have to be ready for that. And I don't yeah. know if we're ready for that next leap or to understand what they would present to us. Did you did you hear about the uh, the um, writer or author from this the Israeli gentleman a couple of years ago? He yeah, wrote the a book. head of uh, yeah head of the satellite defense satellite program uh, for I, Israel. Right. I use him as an example because so many people know this this story, and and I think people should really think about it. So basically, he said, you know, that he's decorated he's you know done his thing he's older he's rich whatever and, and he can talk about it he was told not to talk about it but he was talking anyway right so um he basically said that we have people working on mars humanity humans working on mars and they're working alongside of um extraterrestrials and the extraterrestrial said not to tell us because we're not ready so my advice you know, to to people if they're really interested in in moving forward and you know, us not being a stagnated species, is to uh, you know get on with spreading word, the research. Uh, I think it was Gordon Cooper. No, no, no. Oh, what was his name? I can't think of it now. One of the astronauts. He was very famous for starting a spiritual. Edgar school. Mitchell. Thank you. He said, "Read the books. Do the studying." You know, so that we can move forward, we can we can achieve something. You know, as a as a human race, you know, we don't want to stand stand stagnant. So my advice is not to make that true. What the extraterrestrials were saying, we're not ready. We need to ready ourselves. You know, let them know that we're ready to move on and that we're ready to meet them and to receive information from them and that we're ready to change. You know our ways such as, you know, the atomic weaponry that we're using and fighting about everything. That's what I think we need to be working on. Now, these yeah, well, if, if it's constant, if you and I jumped on a ship and, and went out to Alpha Centauri or, you know, went to Proxima, whatever, we, we went to a planet and we see life there, civilization, but they're shooting and killing each other. Yeah. No, 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 man. We put we put that ship in reverse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> back it up. Back it up. We're yeah. out of here. Yeah. And, uh, we I, we don't have time for this. But we'll, we'll come back. <laughs> we'll come back. We'll, we will. Yeah. We'll come back. But but that's it. We're out of here. But Jimmy, that's not exactly what's happening. That may be happening with many of them, some of them, many of them, but there's still extraterrestrials that are trying to reach us. You know, I wrote my last book and I've got a chapter in there called, you know, Sign Symbols, Messages and Clues. There, there are uh, messages that they've, they've left for, for us. And for example, the crop circles. The crop circles is an easy thing for people to relate to. Everybody knows what they are. They're like, some of them, we should say crop formations because they're the size of several football, you know, fields put together. But mm -hmm. there's been a couple of decoded messages within the crop circles. One of the messages said, beware of, beware of bearers of false gifts. All right. Who they were talking about, we still don't know, but we were able to decode that message. And it just shows you that there are still some that are trying to reach us. Another oh, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. And there again, it goes back to my point, and I'm so happy that you were on the show tonight uh, to discuss all of this. Earth is a beautiful blue gem, and most of the people on this planet—I'm going to use a bad word—kick ass. We're lovely. We're beautiful people. We've got our, you know, we got our issues, but we're going to work through those. What's not to like about this planet? Yeah, okay. So we're the hillbillies of the of the galactic neighborhood, but we're going to get there. And why wouldn't uh, ET be interested in us? Just if nothing else, from an observational point of view, 
you know, we're going to cross that line one day and they're going to go, okay, they're ready. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. All right. All right. Let's, let's, let's get this going. Yeah. I, I totally agree. I've seen too many strange things and okay. heard and seen too many. Okay. Stra- for, for, I've interviewed everybody, but I've yeah. also seen stuff that I cannot explain. So I know they're here for sure. Yeah, I saw a pretty good size uh, UFO when I was around nine years old. Um, Where'd you see it? Where was it? Alexandria, Virginia. I grew up in the Washington metropolitan area. And I tell you, I didn't know what I was looking at. I just remember thinking, I wonder if that's one of those things. And I must have met UFOs in my head, but I never forgot it. And to this day, you know, the thing was was hovering. And um, and it was circular, but I didn't know what I was looking at. It took me to get into this research to really think about that. And I got a headache trying to figure it out. And to this day, I'll drive. I was riding in the car in the dark. And to the, in the dark, to this day, I'm looking out trying to envision this thing again. All right, it was it was big, and so I've seen and I've heard and I felt too. To quote Emmanuel Swedenbird, right? <laughs> that that's him. Um, I know there's a lot more going on here, you know. Yeah, yeah I say it so much. Uh, oh, before we get out of here, um, uh, where can everybody reach out? Oh, my goodness. Um, I have a website, www.acostasvictoriabriggs.com. You can email me through that, or you can go to Facebook and follow me, Constance Victoria Briggs. I've got a moon moon mysteries page, Constance Victoria Briggs moon mysteries, where I put stuff up about the moon all the time. Constance Victoria Briggs galactic mysteries, and uh, yeah, uh, oh, Instagram at galactic Briggs. There you go, and so and we've got everything below in the description over on our website, and also throughout social media too as well. So you can just click and. And and go find Constance. The, what would freak? I, I think that we're ready. You know what I think would freak people out more is Atlantis, right? I think people would lose their minds if there yeah. was a civilization before that came and went. Yeah, uh, yeah, maybe multiple times, right? I think that. I think religions would have an issue with that, right? They would have, you know, they're, 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 I see the freak out. E.T., no, I don't I don't see it as the big freak out in, anymore. Well, you know, Atlantis is one of my favorite subjects. Uh, I'm sorry to tell him that, yeah, I, I believe Atlantis was a thing. I believe Atlantis was real. I think Plato was very serious when he talked about Atlantis. Yeah, they might freak out over it, but they'll get over it. <laughs> yeah. Well, eventually, you know. Have well, to. <laughs> right. well, everybody talks about the big freak out, and I, I just don't see it. Um, I certainly, uh, you know, you brought up Bolivia, right? And when you go to places like that, Bolivia, Puma Punku uh, in Bolivia, or, or Egypt or whatever, when you go to these places and you look around, you know we're being lied to. That's all. You know, you just know, you just look around and you're like, man, there's so I've much. Been lied to. <laughs> I mean, there's so much. You are absolutely right. You know, I wrote a book, my next book. Maybe I'll come on if you invite me to talk about Earth's galactic history. I touch on a lot of those things. And uh, yeah, we've been lied to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know who built the Great Pyramid. I don't know. I don't know about Gobekli Tepe. I don't know about Oyente Tambo or Puma Punka. I don't know. I don't have those answers. But what I do know is what we were told about those things yeah. is a lie. Yeah. That's a fact. That's a fact. We have not been told the truth. Yeah. No, we need to get out there and do our own research. All right. And people like you, Jimmy, with your show who are, you know, trying to get the word out, you know, it's a good thing. People are, we're reaching people. Constance, what a wonderful show tonight. And yes, I look forward to our next conversation. Thank In you, the Jim. meantime, 
Happy Totality Day. What a great day to have you on. And <laughs> go out there and write your next book. Thank you so much. Thank you. Perfect show tonight. What a great way to start the week here on Fade to Black. That was absolutely perfect. And uh, uh, Constance links are below over on our website, and we have them up on social media. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you to Dennis. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Dex. Thank you, Genocide. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. And this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2024 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night on Fade to Black, John Kachuba is with us. We're going to be talking about shapeshifters. Until then, I've just got one thing left. Go back, Lee Tappy.